so now we have these things we have to talk about in the brain. All right? So for years, we thought the whole action in the brain was the neurons. And it turns out that that's wrong. That's maybe half the action in the brain. The other half of the action in the brain is the neuroglia, which are the supporting structures. Now, for the longest time, we thought neuroglia was simply the skeleton, the exoskeleton of the nervous system that kind of supported and held the, the neurons in place. Turns out that that's not correct. So yes, the neuroglia are the connective tissue of the brain, that they insulate the neurons by forming myelin sheaths around the nerves, that they supply nutrients and oxygen to the neuron, but they modulate neurotransmission. All right, so they're extremely important for whether or not what gets transmitted or doesn't get transmitted. The, the, we'll come back to the specifics of some of this. They destroy pathogens. Uh, they create the cerebral spinal fluid, and they form the blood-brain barrier. So they got a lot of things that they're doing, and without doing any of that, you know, you take away the, the neurons, and you no longer have a brain. But if you leave the neurons and you take away the glial structure, you no longer have a brain. You need both. Okay, they're extremely important for each other. And if you take a look at this, there's four major cells that make up the uh, the glial cells and the neuroglia of the brain. Most of them are oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes create the myelin sheath, the, lie, the layer that insulates everything around. A disease in which you see loss of those myelin sheaths is multiple sclerosis. With the loss of those myelin sheath, you see loss of the insulation, and you get lots of crosstalk and lots of noise going on in the system. It doesn't function properly. The astrocytes uh, have a whole other role in terms of removing specific neurotransmitters so they don't accumulate in, in the space between the neurons and overstimulate the neurons. Uh, they also create the blood-brain barrier uh, and the blood-CSF barrier. Uh, the microglia, which we're going to be focused on, have the smallest footprint in, in terms of the glial cells, but in our, in the diseases we're going to be talking about here, they have the largest impact. So this is just a picture of what these things look like, and so here we see oligodendrocytes running around coating the neurons in order to uh, protect them, but they also all create these gaps, and those gap junctions allow the neurons to fire much more rapidly. So the signal moves much faster down the, down the neuron as a result of those gap junctions. And then sitting off to the side, we see an astrocyte, which is creating the blood-brain barrier again, and then these little guys up in the corner here, the microglia. There's a couple of interesting things about microglia. They're not attached to anything, they just float around. All right. They are the innate immune system of the central nervous system. And they are going to be the focus of what we're doing. So the mediators of inflammation in the brain and the spinal cord are microglia. These cells are critical to our understanding about what's going on. These cells, uh, in a major text in neurology in 1990, were said to not exist. We would thought about them, we looked at them, we looked carefully for them back and forth for over about 100 years and finally concluded they don't exist. 16,000 papers later in PubMed, it turns out they do exist. There are people building their entire careers on these little guys, and it turns out that they are critical for what we're going to be talking about in terms of pain and depression. And so microglia, the resident cells of the brain, they're involved in the regulatory processes critical for development and maintenance of normal neuronal environment, injury and repair. They're the electricians of the CNS, and they are the innate immune system. What does that mean? In a neonatal brain, okay, brand new brain forming, what happens is you get all these neurons growing all over the place. All right? How do they know where to connect and how do they not short each other out in overlap? Well, the microglia run around okay, in an amoeboid form. They literally move around and they make sure that the synapses have smooth highways, that everything's firing in the direction it should be firing and that anything extraneous gets trimmed off. So without the microglia, you can't have a functioning brain. So they're absolutely essential early on. Later, they move into what's called a ramified state, and that ramified state looks exactly like that. They've got all these little branches kind of all over the place. And this ramified state, they sit there and they float around and they're monitoring the functioning of the central nervous system. And when you've got synapses, when you've got old neurons sitting around that aren't firing the way they're supposed to, microglia run in and clean them up, remove them. If you have an infection that comes into the system, the microglia move in to remove that infection. Microglia are responsible for normal cell repair and regeneration in the central nervous system. So they're extremely important for the day-to-day -day functioning and they're important for our defense. 
They are the only cells in the central nervous system that are responsible for defense of our central nervous system. They're also not connected to other pieces of the central nervous system, as we saw with pictures of the uh, oligodendrocytes and the astroglia, which are connected part of the structure. The microglia actually can move around. And uh, this functional plasticity, this business of going from a ramified state into an activated state into a macrophage state. So what happens is when they get turned on, when they get activated by any of a number of things, they move from this ramified state, they move into this hyperactive state where the branches get thicker, and they start moving into an amoeboid state, which means they can now move around the central nervous system. And they start secreting all kinds of interesting substances, and eventually can turn into a full-fledged macrophage. Macrophages gobble up bacteria, viruses, and they take them and, ex and remove them from the system. The way cells respond to things is they have to secrete a receptor onto the cell membrane. So that cell membrane gets some chemical comes in and whether or not that cell can respond to it is determined by whether or not it can secrete a receptor that will then allow that information to come into the cell. So we have to think about everything as information processing in the, in the central nervous system. So these guys can secrete upwards of about 35 different receptors on their cell. All right, that's an amazing number of receptors. Most cells can't begin to respond to that much stimuli in the environment. So they've got upwards of 35 different types of receptors they can respond to. Uh, what they have here is receptors to opioids, cannabinoids, and benzodiazepines. That starts to give us some understanding as to ways that we can begin to work with the microglia in order to either upregulate them or downregulate them. And this is a real problem because one of the things we reach for in treating chronic pain is opioids. All right? We were watching our patients with chronic pain and chronic depression, and we would give them opioid medication, and their pain would get better, and their depression would get worse. And we took them off the opioids, and then their pain would get worse, but at least their depression was a little more manageable. What happens with microglia when you throw opioids at them is that they are responsible for the tolerance that develops to opioids, so they make you need more of them, and they're responsible for hyperalgesia. What that means is when they get turned on, you actually end up in more pain. So think about this. Opioid medications, which we have now been using for over a decade for treatment of chronic benign pain, lock people into their pain. Maybe not such a spiffy idea. Now, in the short term, the use of opioids is not a problem because there's five times as many opioid receptors on the neurons as there are in the microglia, so that's why we can get away with short-term use of these drugs. Long-term use of these drugs, we create a problem. At the point that we commit you to chronic opioid therapy, you're committed. We need to be very smart and rethink what we're doing with opioid medications in the treatment of chronic pain because I know they do the wrong thing to microglia. We've already started to approve the use of marijuana, marijuana derivatives for the treatment of chronic pain, and it turns out that there are two types of marijuana, cannabinoid receptors, on the microglia. Uh, one gets you a bit high, but the other one actually does a nice job of down-regulating microglia and reducing neuroinflammation. And in fact, there's a large number of people who have post-traumatic stress syndrome who already have figured this out. That by smoking cannabis, they actually find that their anxiety is significantly improved. That's probably one of the major mechanisms via which that's happening. So you always hit one in type 1 and type 2 receptors uh, when you're using marijuana. It would be nice if we could be more specific. Uh, and get the one that specifically down-regulates the microglia. <coughs> benzos we're still trying to figure out. What are benzos? Benzos are uh, all of your sleeping medications. Ambien, Lunesta, um, Sonata. Uh, they are Clonopin, all your anti-anxiety agents, and Valium. We're not entirely certain how the benzos react on the microglia, but we know that they seem to interfere with the way energy is processed in the cell and de deplete the way the energy is processed. 
And why does this become curious to us? Because we now have studies showing that chronic use, chronic being defined as greater than four times a month of benzodiazepines, shortens people's lifespan. All cause mortality, cancers, heart disease, stroke. We do not understand the mechanisms yet, but we do know that chronic use of these medications will shorten your lifespan. So as we begin to understand, you're beginning to understand the utility of knowing what microglia do and why that target becomes so important to us. So looking at these receptors, we begin to understand, as we understand the physiology of microglia, we can begin to extrapolate that to what's happening in the clinic and how we're treating you guys. The microglia also kick out a huge number, about 32 different factors, and they are responsible for causing new growth of cells, they're responsible for responding to infections and getting rid of the infection, they're responsible for killing cells that have come into the body, uh, they actually set off these uh, superoxide uh, bombs that will go into bacteria and literally explode them and then turn into a macrophage, clean that up and take them out. So, very important in terms of our immune system functioning in the central nervous system. So microglia are responsible to and activated by a wide variety of environmental stimuli. So as we turn on the microglia, this is where the rubber hits the road. It is by understanding the pathophysiology, neurophysiology of microglia, that it allows us to completely change the conversation about these diseases. So if we think that depression, we think that uh, chronic pain, are neuroinflammatory diseases, and we know that the cell that is the only cell, there's not 16 cells, the only cell that can mediate inflammation in the central nervous system is the microglia, then the more we understand about the microglia, the more we can understand about how you're getting sick, why you're staying sick, and what we can do to help you recover. Neurodegenerative diseases. We see the microglia activated in Alzheimer's disease, in AIDS-related dementia, uh, in Parkinson's disease. At re, or in the debate it rages as to whether or not they're the cause of the problem or whether or not they're a response to the problem or whether or not there's an abnormality in their response that actually allows these diseases uh, to progress, uh, and the debate still goes on. For the most part, we're reasonably certain they are not the cause of the problem, but a dysfunction of them may actually be the cause. So we're taking a look at that now. Also in multiple sclerosis. Infections. All right, anybody know about pandas? Pandas is this lovely disease where kids get strep infections. Then the next thing they get is ticks, obsessive compulsive disorders. And it's a disaster for them. And this is, a, this is a, an infection that's invading the central nervous system and setting off, we think, this autoimmune process. It's got to be mediated through microglia and the upregulation of the microglia. But other infections, Lyme disease, Bartonella, Babesia, okay, chronic Epstein-Barr, these Lyme-related disorders, what's going on and why we see so much neurologic issues is because of their impact on the microglia. Trauma, now trauma comes in a couple of different forms, but if you've had a bunch of concussions, that upregulates the microglia, so traumatic brain injury. I just saw a gentleman today who served in the military, uh, he lost three tanks. I actually asked him how come we didn't charge him for them, uh, but he didn't quite lose them. They got all blown up while he was in them. Uh, so this poor guy has had three episodes of traumatic brain injury. All of that really fires up the brain, all right? And at the time that he sustained these, we didn't have any idea what we were doing, and this remained uh, a very active problem with him. He subsequently develops post-traumatic stress syndrome. Part of that certainly related to uh, the exposures in combat, but no question that the other part of the issue has to do with the injury to the brain itself. So traumatic brain injury will upregulate microglia because they're responsible for the repair, but you do it over and over again and they don't downregulate, and they stay in a hyperinflammatory state. So multiple concussions can push you over the edge in terms of doing this. Psychological trauma. It turns out that long-term stress upregulate microglia and turn them into inflammatory factors. It also turns out that if you look at the post-traumatic stress syndrome curve, the overwhelming majority of them actually had family lives that were extremely traumatic and stressful. And so 
about 15, 20% of our returning vets end up with post-traumatic stress syndrome. How come 80% don't? There are priming mechanisms that's gone on that set up the microglia. So psychological stress will do it. Uh, physical trauma will do it. Toxins, okay? Lead and um, uh, diesel particles have been shown to upregulate microglia. But also mycotoxins poisons that we see in the environment that occur in houses where there's been mold overgrowth, where there's been bacterial overgrowth with exotoxins and, uh, that get secreted from these bacteria. There's a huge number of them that were found uh, following Katrina. It's not just mold in the house, but it's also bacterial overgrowth that occurs in the house. And all of these things get aerosolized and ultimately this business of these vague symptoms, these difficulties, focusing, concentrating, this fatigue that comes on on these people. All of this is really hyperreactivity of the microglia that's going on. And so we're looking at the causes of this stuff. Medications, we've already talked about uh, some of the medications, the opioids in particular, that can upregulate them. But there are also medications, we'll talk about in a minute, that can downregulate them that we want to look at. Hypoxia. What would cause hypoxia? A loss of oxygen to the brain. Affects 5% of the population in the U.S. at least. Anybody know? Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea. So if you stop breathing at night, you lose oxygen to your brain. That will upregulate the microglia and leave it in a chronic inflammatory state. So then we have to start asking questions about sleep apnea. How do you sleep? What are you doing? Ischemia is simply stroke, anything that reduces blood supply to the brain. So now we know that there's a bunch of things that can upregulate the microglia. We know that depression and chronic pain are neuroinflammatory diseases. But now we know that there's a bunch of things that can turn these things on, and there's a bunch of questions that we have to ask in taking a history. So our whole perspective on these diseases completely changes when we quit calling it depression and we quit calling it myotoxicity, we could call it, I'm sorry, we could call it a chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and we now think of it as a neuroinflammatory disease. Thinking about these diseases from a neurophysiologic perspective changes the questions we ask, presents us with a whole new set of opportunities to cure these problems.